Hello everyone, Ken here. Welcome to my 2015 Game of the Year Awards. I've put together a collection of award categories ranging from the standard to the silly, and I'm going to make a completely unnecessary attempt to rank all my favourites in each from the past 12 months. Now it was tough going, but I've cut every category down to four nominees and a winner. As always, bear in mind that these are all my own personal opinions, so if you've got something you'd like to talk about, then feel free to do so in the comments below. So, without further ado, let's get started. Most Esports Dota 2, the champ is here. Dota 2 comes into 2015's awards on a two-year winning streak for this category. It might be slightly more difficult to pick up off the bat than most games, but once you've grasped the basics, it's one of the most exciting viewer experiences going. It certainly doesn't hurt that Valve's in-client spectator mode is still probably the best around, with a wealth of statistics, control options and integrated broadcaster tools at your fingertips. Can anyone topple the king this year? Heroes of the Storm I'd watched Heroes of the Storm a few times during its beta periods, but while I could see why people were enjoying it, None of it really felt for me. That all changed when I got my hands on it, however. Playing for a while gave me a much better understanding of the unique facets of HOTS in comparison to other MOBAs, and I rather took a shine to it. The multiple maps and key objectives which come with each of them ensures that team strategies and game flow vary wildly, even over the course of a single series. Rocket League One of the most eye-opening moments after Rocket League's release was discovering videos and live streams of the best players, ones who had spent up to six years with the game's predecessor. Watching matches play out at breakneck speed, with players pinging passes back and forth as they sped up the pitch, and smashing in spectacular aerials with consummate ease, suddenly makes you realise just how outrageously high Rocket League's skill ceiling is. Even after so many hours, I still can't fathom how they pull some of those moves off. Super Mario Maker. A bit of a wild card pick this one, but possibly my favourite part of Super Mario Maker this year was watching people craft tough levels and then seeing others attempt to pull them apart and beat them, and I think that qualifies. The most notable of these was Patrick Klebik and Dan Reichert's three-part feud, but I might have enjoyed watching Patrick tackle Jeff Gerstmann's levels even more, as they tended to focus on awkward and unusual sequences as opposed to Dan's outright devious trickery. Esports! Hail to the king, baby. The competition this year was tough, but ultimately there's still one game standing head and shoulders above the rest for me, and that's Dota 2. I didn't even really spend that much time playing Dota 2 in 2015, what with all the incredible new releases that came out, but that didn't stop me from watching hours and hours of top-level competitive play. The highlight, as always, was the International, which this year managed to ratchet up a staggering $18,429,613 in community-funded prize money, including a small helping of my own, comfortably enough by itself to set eventual victors evil geniuses atop the highest earners list for 2015. Certainly a moment to remember for the team of Universe, Aoi2000, PPD, Fear and their 16-year-old mid lane player Sumail. There were plenty of other big tournaments this year as well, and I came back to them consistently thanks to the vast support from Valve and the community, and also in part due to the still unmatched spectator tools that the game offers. 2015 also saw the unveiling of Dota 2 Reborn, bringing a fresh new interface and engine to keep Dota 2 at the very forefront of both casual and competitive play. Best World Design Bloodborne. Although Bloodborne doesn't deal in the wide variety of environments the Dark Souls series has previously, their tighter focus allowed FromSoft to create what felt like a more complete and densely packed sprawl. From the early moments navigating the carefully interwoven streets of central Yharnam, the world actually feels more open-ended at times than Dark Souls despite its much smaller size, thanks to the multitude of interconnected pathways. I was also a big fan of the use of verticality, such as returning to the upper alcoves of the Grand Cathedral towards the end of the game. Invisible Inc. Set deep in the cyberpunk espionage future of 2074, Invisible Inc. spares no time establishing its world in the central players. One of the nicest touches is the specialisations of the rival security forces, which builds a sense of how they came to be and where they collaborated. 
It also helps to lead to some interesting mission selection decisions. Infiltrating K&O's security facility might allow you more access to their other zones, but it also will eat up valuable time if you're traveling a long distance to reach it. Mad Max The world Mad Max presents may be little more than a sandy wasteland, but what a fantastically realized sandy wasteland it is. Avalanche Studios made a fantastic job of capturing the essence of Mad Max. From the roaring jets of flame that shoot out of just about anywhere they can, to the ramshackle construction of Raider Outposts. The bigger outposts and cities loom large across the horizon as you speed through the desert looking for trouble, while there's a palpable sense of danger to each of the factions that could end up being that trouble that you find. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt The world of The Witcher 3 is as stunningly dense as it is breathtakingly vast. Whether you're riding through the wilds of Velen, wandering the streets of Novigrad, or sailing to the Isles of Skellige, there's a palpable sense of scale to Geralt's journeys. Yet you can walk little more than a minute in any direction and find a wealth of stories to uncover. People struggling to get by under Nilfgaardian rule, small communities terrorised by monster attacks, a singing rock troll who just wants to paint an insignia. These four games all capture their chosen aesthetic wonderfully and construct living, breathing worlds around them. But The Witcher 3's world stands out as the one which feels the most believable as a standalone entity from the game. While NPCs and enemies in games can so often give you the impression that they exist only to be interacted with by the player, in The Witcher 3 you can imagine that everything has been there long before Geralt's arrival, and would continue to exist even if he had never shown up. It's a clever trick because oftentimes characters do stay in the same location and have the same interactions, yet walking through the streets of Novigrad feels as though you're in a bustling town filled with people going about their daily duties. Witcher 3's beauty certainly isn't limited to its settlements, however. The hills and valleys, forests and coves, beaches and streams are all stunning and have the feel of real natural locations rather than seeming like purpose-constructed video game places. The creatures which inhabit those worlds never feel out of place either, even at their most bizarre. It certainly doesn't help that by now the world of The Witcher has had so many years to build up a rich vein of lore, but that doesn't make it any less impressive to explore and discover the characters, creatures and cities of The Witcher 3. Best Surprise Heroes of the Storm I never thought Heroes of the Storm was going to do it for me. I understood the appeal of a simpler, more accessible take on the likes of Dota 2 and League of Legends, but watching others play it's never sparked any interest for me. The mechanics it leaves out, such as last hitting and buying items, are things I particularly enjoy about those other games. Yet when I finally decided to try it on a whim, I found myself instantly hooked, losing the best part of a week to it at a time when I already had plenty of other big titles to play. Rocket League like the Viper Randy Orton before it, Rocket League really came out of nowhere. I'd heard of supersonic acrobatic rocket power battle cars at the time, but although the concept was neat, the reception was fairly lukewarm. Yet suddenly everyone was shouting very loudly about this game that you had to try out. It took me 10 seconds of watching it in action to know that I wanted to play it, and 10 seconds of playing it to know that this was a game destined to keep me busy for potentially hundreds of hours more. Splatoon. As soon as Splatoon was unveiled, I was excited about it. It was cute and colourful, a multiplayer shooter where anime squid teens splatted each other with neon ink. I lost count of the number of times I excitedly shouted the phrase squid abilities whenever someone brought Splatoon up, yet there was always this deep concern. After all, this was an online multiplayer shooter from Nintendo. Apparently I needn't have worried. Splatoon was the freshest and most fun multiplayer shooter I played all year. Until Dawn. Until Dawn started life as a first-person PlayStation 3 game with PlayStation Move functionality, then disappeared entirely until it finally re-emerged in 2014 as a third-person PlayStation 4 title. As if its troubled development wasn't concerning enough, it had apparently become a Quantic Dream-style narrative-driven decision-making game in the vein of a teen slasher horror. So what a pleasant surprise it was when it turned out to be exactly that, but somehow managed to completely pull it off. A pleasant surprise is always a great feeling and there wasn't a bigger surprise for me this year than just how much I fell in love with Until Dawn. I'm not much of a horror fan and I've never been especially enamoured with that decision-based quick time style of game either, but somehow it all came together in a way I wasn't expecting. 
The characters are wonderful takes on classic teen horror stereotypes, yet they all bring their own personality to the game and I became attached to many of them over the course of the story. The performances are pretty fantastic across the board, with Pierto Stomara in particular standing out as the deliciously menacing psychiatrist, Dr. Hill. I was concerned that their don't move mechanic where you must hold the controller still to avoid detection would be unreliable, but in fact it worked rather well and actually made for some fantastically tense moments. The decision making was fairly well handled too, rarely coming off as obvious which option was optimal and carefully blending in consequential choices with impactful ones so that each selection felt important. It did come to an end rather suddenly and abruptly in a way I didn't love, but for a game comprised primarily of elements that don't ordinarily appeal to me to bring me so much joy in both playing it myself and watching others go through it was a delightful surprise. Best Ending Okay, a quick heads up for our final category today. This one, somewhat unsurprisingly, is all about the very end of these games, so there will be some big story spoilers for our four nominees, The Beginner's Guide, Invisible Ink, Starcraft 2 Legacy of the Void, and Undertale. If you're planning to play those, you might want to hop out now, and I'll catch you next time. Otherwise, let's get to it. The Beginner's Guide. The Beginner's Guide is all about building to a moment, and that moment comes with The Tower, described by narrator Davy as the last game that Coda ever made. Following your entire progression through Coda's game history, along with Davy's interpretations on the meanings of each of them, you discover that this insistence on analysing and incorporating solutions to all his games was precisely what drove Coda away from creating new experiences. It's a fantastic gut punch of a twist. Invisible Ink. After 72 hours on the run, you finally infiltrate Omni Headquarters, and Central manages to insert the Incognito AI into the mainframe. The plan was to wipe Invisible's presence from the records, giving them a clean start. But as soon as she's enabled, Incognito takes complete control of the mainframe, activates orbital lasers and obliterates the other megacorporations, killing thousands of people, much to Central's horror. Rogue AI isn't a new concept, but the implementation really caught me unawares. Starcraft 2 Legacy of the Void Starcraft 2's story goes to some real wild places, but nothing so crazy as Legacy of the Void's epilogue, which sees Terran turn Zerg Queen of Blades Kerrigan, absorb the essence of Oros and ascend to become Zelnaga herself, a godlike flaming being of light, before putting an end to the fallen Aemon once and for all. Cuts to wrap-up montage covering the post-war cleanup and the only way that the tale of James Raynor and Kerrigan could end. Undertale. The neutral ending of Undertale is powerful enough by itself, with you unable to save King Asgore and forced to battle a godlike Flowey. That first story told on an initial playthrough is already fascinating. However, the game's real ace in the whole is the hugely different revelations which come from each possible playstyle and final outcome. There's far too much to cover here, but learning the true nature of Frisk, Asriel and the Fallen Child presents a mind-boggling series of revelations which completely alter your perspective on many key events of the game. All of these games have powerful endings, but none hits me quite as strongly this year as that of The Beginner's Guide. The Tower starts off much like any other one of Coda's games. Davy begins to lead you through the level which he says was privately sent to him by Coda. The Tower is comprised of a series of basic puzzles, but each one is an increasingly less completable encounter, causing Davy to bypass each of them in turn, until you reach the final one, a room with the exit switch on the outside, a puzzle that cannot be solved without modification. Passing that brings you to a room where Coda speaks directly to Davy, explaining that Davy's insistence on analysing Coda's games, on showing them to others and on altering them to create solutions where none were intended to exist, has driven Coda away from creating. He asks Davy to relent from his actions and not to speak with him again. After being led through Coda's entire series of works and their potential meanings by Davy's inquiring musings, you're hit with the reveal that not only were those musings perhaps inaccurate, but that their mere existence is entirely against Coda's wishes. Yet even in the moment, Davy cannot bring himself to let go. It's a fascinating take on the potential relationship between creator and consumer, and while it certainly has a melodramatic edge to it, it poses a whole bunch of interesting questions. And that's all the awards for today. 
Thank you for joining me. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to bop that like button and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more from me. I've been Ken. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers!